teaching um, that I was in the, I'd, I'd done two parts of it. This is the third part this week, which will be on humility, meekness, and the love of God. Now, this is a very powerful uh, message that's going to help your life. Um, this is, uh, 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 like I've said in past weeks, you know, if, <laughs> if you... If you're sitting here listening to this message and you're thinking, wow, man, if only somebody else, you know, that you know was here to hear this message, I can guarantee you this message is for you. <laughs> By virtue of just thinking that way, this message is for you. And I also want to say thank you, my wife and I want to say thank you for all the pastor appreciation gifts and things you've given to us. It's been such a blessing, such an honor to be your pastors. We just say thank you, thank you, thank you from the bottom of our heart. We're very grateful for all that you've given to us. Praise God. Hallelujah. So, if you have your Bible, go with me to Romans chapter 12, verse 2. And uh, let's pray and I'll get right into this. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you, Father, for your word. We come before your word with, a, with an expectation to hear, to receive of you. Lord, we know that you will give us revelation knowledge, revealed knowledge into your will, into your ways. So we have an expectation to hear and to receive of you. And I thank you, Lord, that you have anointed me to minister the gospel with accuracy, with boldness. Lord, help me to do so in a way that brings edification to the body of Christ tonight, that we will leave here changed by the power of your word and by the mighty Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Praise God. Now, being humble, meek, walking in love, God kind of love, is not popular. <laughs> it's not displayed in the world very often. It's, it's not acceptable by worldly standards. It's barely even seen in the church amongst Christians, unfortunately. It's in, a, in incredible short supply. It's often thought of by unbelievers as being weak if you're if you're humble and you're meek and you and you walk in love and and that's how just society views it however walking and living in humility in the love of God in meekness will cause you to be extremely attractive extremely attractive it's it, it you you will be attractive to your spouse to, to the people at, that are serving you, um, it, it, or if you serve them, um, to, to your boss, to your co-workers. When you walk in humility, God kind of love and meekness, people are just attracted to you. And uh, it, it is just really close to God's heart. It is how we imitate, as we're told to do, it's how we imitate our Heavenly Father. And it's, it's the key to living successfully in the kingdom of God. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more tonight. And it's not, it's not what the world thinks is, is cool. It's not what the world thinks is, is being strong. But it's the key to our spiritual inheritance in Christ. Is walking and living in humility, in the love of God, and in meekness with one another. And in fact, one more thing, it is actually how we truly find and live in rest. Rest. I'm not necessarily referring to sleeping, but it would include your sleep. <laughs> It'll, it, 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 it's, it's key to that. Praise God. All right. So let's look here in Romans 12 too. It says, do not copy the behavior and customs of this world. Well, that's why I'm saying this world doesn't act like this. The, for the most part, the world is not humble. They're not meek. And for the most part, the world just doesn't know how to operate in the God kind of love. But here he says, 
the Apostle Paul's writings, all inspired by the Holy Spirit. He says, don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person. Okay? Say new person. So, I mean, you might not be living like this, or you might think, oh yeah, this is the way I am, but I'm telling you, God can transform you into a new person. I don't care how bad or how good you think you are, God walking in the ways of God and His Word transforms your life, and it will transform everything about the way you live. But it says, let Him transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Now look at this, these next words. Then you will learn to know. Say, learn to know. (laughs) See, you're learning tonight from God's Word. But you're learning it, but you need to get to a place that you learn to know to do it. Now that might seem like, well, what do you mean? Well, have you ever tried to do something for the first time, and you're not so clever at it, you're not so smooth at it, but you have an instructor, and that instructor makes it look easy. Is that right? I mean, it's it's like second nature to them. They do it, and you're like, well, yeah, you see them, and you think, I can do that just like that. But then you actually go to physically do it, and it doesn't really come out like that. But you can learn to know how to do it like that. It doesn't mean you can't do it. It just means you need to learn to know how to do it that way. And walking in humility, the love of God, meekness, you can learn to know it. You can learn to know God's way of doing things. You learn to know it. It doesn't mean you get it right every time. The instructors didn't get it right the first time they did it, but they learned to know it. And we can learn to know God's ways of doing things. Amen? It's one of the reasons we come to church, because we learn to know. We don't know it all, but we're learning to know His way. Amen? And so he says, learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. God's will for you is good, amen, pleasing, and it is perfect. I'm going to say it again. God's will for you is good, God's will for you is pleasing. God's will for you is perfect. Hallelujah. You can learn to know God's will for you. A lot of people think they know God's will, but they don't really know God's will because if you talk to them long enough, they'll come out of a well, you never know, whatever, you know, whatever. If it's God's will, then this is the way it'll be. Wait a minute, you can learn to know God's will. That's what we're reading here. What do you mean I can learn to know? You're a child of God. God is your father He doesn't want you just fumbling and bumbling through life, wondering what his will is. God desires to reveal his will. The problem is people's thinking is they don't think they can know the will of God, but you can know the will of God. Say, I can know the will of God for my life. It is good. It is pleasing. And it is perfect. Amen right there puts you far ahead of a lot of people who don't know that they can know the will of God for their life. But you're going to learn to know the will of God. So I've already commented about how most of society doesn't really respond in situations in a way with God's love or or love towards a situation, towards one another. They don't respond in love towards one another. Most of society um, doesn't know how to really walk in true humility. There's a lot of false humility out there, a lot of things that people think they're being humble, and really it's not humility at all. We'll get to that in this teaching, probably not tonight. Um, They really don't know how to operate in meekness towards one another. In fact, most people love themselves more than they love anyone else. And I'm not saying you shouldn't love yourself, but you, you shouldn't love yourself more than you love other people. Amen? Love your neighbor as yourself. Love yourself, but love your neighbor as yourself. That's the number one commandment in the New Testament. Do you know that? Love your neighbor as yourself. Amen? Now, a lot of people want to be humble um, towards 
you know, they, they want, let me say it like this, they want people to be humble towards them, you know. It's interesting how people can recognize when other people aren't acting in humility towards them or when others aren't being meek towards them, but when it comes to, to them operating in that, you know, they don't hold their, themselves accountable to that same level of humility and meekness and love. You, you, you have an idea what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> they, want, they hold other people to a higher standard than they hold themselves. Hey, I'm guilty of this myself. I'm not happy about that, but I've, I've done this. And, I've, and, the, and the Holy Spirit's like, wait, wait, wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait a minute. You, you expect that of them, but you yourself did this. And that's what's so powerful about the Holy Spirit because he'll reveal real quick in you what you need to work on in you. And that is wonderful. Amen? Praise God. Now, the world, uh, you know, they just don't have the inward guide that you have as a, as a born-again Christian because you have the Holy Spirit residing on the inside of you. And many people are just, well, just say it bluntly, they're just ignorant of the Scriptures and ignorant of what the Word of God says, so they just really don't know. And it's no wonder that the, that, that pride just runs rampant in our society because of, of, of a lack of understanding, a lack of knowledge of the Word of God, and flat out, in a lot of ways, just ignoring the, the, the ministry gift of the Holy Spirit on the inside of them, who's there to help them and guide them and lead them. Amen? Now go to Romans 12, 10. Just look at the 10th verse here. It says, Be kindly affectionate one to another with brotherly love. Say brotherly love. In honor, preferring one another. Oh, doing what to one another? Preferring one another. Should, should, does, you think this actually applies to us? You think we should prefer one another? L listen to the New Living Translation. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. Take delight in what? Now, is it just me, or do you think this is in short supply? <laughs> I think this is in, in great short supply. And it's amazing, and it's so beautiful how people respond when you do honor them, when you do prefer them. People pick up on it really quick. They recognize it really quick. They'll recognize it around the office. They'll recognize it if they're coworkers or, 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 or in your own family. It's quickly recognized. Listen to the Passion Translation. Be devoted to tenderly loving your fellow believers as members of one family. Try to outdo yourselves in respect and honor of one another. Wow. Wow. One more, one more. Listen to the message. Love from the center of who you are. Don't fake it. Run for dear life from evil. Hold on for dear life to good. Be good friends who love deeply. Look at this. Practice playing second fiddle. Practice playing second fiddle. I like that. You know, that means you don't have to be the person up front that everybody sees, that everybody knows. Look at me. Look what I have. Look what I can do, right? Practice playing second fiddle. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Well, the Lord's speaking to us tonight, isn't he? Now, we have to... We, we really have to constantly or consistently check ourselves in here, right? We have to regular, regularly confer with the Holy Spirit to make sure we don't copy the world's ways, that we don't act like the world and just blend so in with the world that we just mimic them, copy them, behave like them. No, we have to... We, we need to be checking our own heart. Amen? Because the Holy Spirit will help you with this. 
And listen, there is no one exempt from this. There is no one listening to this message that you've got this all figured out, including myself up here. This is something that I have to work on on a regular basis. Today, multiple times, yet today, the Lord was dealing with me in different situations right where this message is. And I knew what I was going to preach, and I still blew it. Like, at least three times today, I blew it in this, but I made correction. That's the difference. I made correction. Amen? Amen. Be willing to make correction in your life. Be willing to hear from the Lord, confer with Him, take, take an inventory on your, own, on your own actions and your own words and how you're acting, and make change. Our culture is not big on humility. So you're not going to learn humility from the culture that's around you. You're going to learn humility from the Word of God and by the direction giving of the Spirit of God. Amen? <laughs> you, 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 you can help it, though. You, if you're operating in, in, in pride, you can make a change. You don't have to say, well, it's my personality. No, no. This is for everyone. Well, it's how I was raised. No, you can change. <laughs> you can help the way you treat others. Glory to God. Hallelujah. You can help it. You can make a change. And we can all improve in this. Amen? And you can control. Listen to this. You can control how you respond to other people. When they're not nice to you. When they're not lovely to you. When they're full of pride. When they're treating you wrong. You can respond in love to them. Because the Bible tells us to love those who hate you and despitefully use you. If the Bible tells us to do that, then we are empowered and equipped to do it. And we're equipped and empowered by the Spirit of God, by the love of God that's dwelling on the inside of us. And I'm telling you, that is not weak. That is, takes a very strong person. And that strength comes from one who is living inside of you. And that is when you are strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. In your own strength, you can't do it. You got flesh, I got flesh. We all want to respond in the same way, right? You come at me once, I'm going to come at you twice. But we can learn to know how to operate and live according to the will of God, which these are the standards and the principles that are set up within the kingdom of God. And when we choose to operate this way, this is how we live this awesome, successful way of living. It's, it causes you, like I said, to be attractive to others. You, you walk, you will walk. I, I have seen and I've personally met a number of very wealthy people that operate in this level of humility. And it is absolutely, I, I, I've met wealthy people that aren't, that are full of pride. And I've met wealthy people that are so, walk in such humility. And you know who I want to be like? The humble person. You're around the prideful person, and you know they have money. You, you know it. You don't even like, you're like, I don't want to be like that. But when you're around somebody that, that is operating in wealth and integrity, and they're humble, it is so beautiful. You're like, that is so cool. That is so cool. And you know, you usually don't find out they're wealthy until later on because of their humility. I remember, I, was, I, I think I told the story before, but I, I met these people and, and we were talking about doing some business together with them. And, and I think I shared this yeah, a few weeks ago and we were looking at doing a project together on a piece of property. And I said, you know, well, you know, yeah, you know, want to see if you're interested in this and want to meet us. And so I meet them, you know, and this is a number of years ago. This is, well, it was 10 years ago, in fact. And I met them. And, uh, you know, get in this little tiny compact car, and we drive down to this, you know, and, you're, you know, I'm not expecting much. I'm just wanting, but they were nice people. They were great, lovely people. And we get there, and it's like, well, you know, would you think we could do the project on this land? I'm like, how big is this place? Well, I think this is around 2,500 acres. You own all this? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Are you kidding me? So then it didn't work out because of some, some regulatory things that were going on with that property and, and land and, and water rights, so we couldn't do the project there. So I thought it was, okay, we're just not going to do the project. 
they call me up and they're like, well, would you think you'd have time to look at another site? I'm like, another site? Well, yeah, we've got some property over here. We go over there. It's on State Road 60, and it's 90 acres in the middle of Brandon. Nine, and I'm like, are you kidding me? How much are you people worth? But they were operated in such humility and kindness and love. That's attractive, is my point. You know, some, you, know you ever meet somebody and, they're, and they want to brag about everything they have, and they're bragging about everything they have, and it's over in 30 seconds. Maybe 15 seconds. My point is, is just that it really does make you attractive. And it's, it's really the way the body of Christ is supposed to be operating. In this, in this kind of love, in this kind of humility, in this kind of meekness. And this is something that all of us have to learn to know how to do. And I've met prideful people that have hardly anything. Don't think that pride is only a problem for people that maybe have a little bit of money or something like that. <laughs> no, no, no. You've ever heard this? Well, we don't got much, but we got our pride. <laughs> well, that isn't any good either. <laughs> that statement is, is, is they, tr they make that statement in an attempt to be humble, but that's not a good statement. Amen? <laughs> you can respond, you, you can control how you respond to other people and how they treat you. Amen? And what's inside of you is how you will react in difficult situations. I'm going to say that again. What's inside of you is how you will react in difficult situations. If you, if you fail when you're under pressure, it's changeable. It's correctable. Just go back, dedicate yourself to God to his word and say, you know what? I don't like how I react in that situation. I want to do, I want to be better in that. And so I want to make a change. And so you have to be willing to go to the word and allow the Holy Spirit to help you so you can mature in these areas so you learn how to respond differently the next time. Amen. Go to Matthew chapter 11, verse 29, please. Now it's important to understand that God's kingdom operates very differently than how the world's kingdoms and systems operate, right? Look here in Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29. We're going to read through this in a couple of different translations. First being King James. It says, take my yoke upon you. Here it is again, learn of me. You see this learning of me? This learning, remember, learn to know? He says, learn of me. He says, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. You shall find rest unto your souls. Say rest, rest. unto my soul. my soul. So it's interesting, he says, he's, he's talking here, he says, take my yoke upon you, learn of me. And what are we learning? Well, we're learning, he's saying that I'm meek and I'm lowly in heart. He says, and you'll shall find rest. There's a connection to this rest, to learning meekness and being lowly in heart. There's a connection to it. So if you're wondering why you're uptight and anxious and, and all this stuff, there's a connection to, to being free from that. There's a connection to living in the rest of God. And this isn't sleeping, but I said it, it will affect your sleep, but this is living at rest. Amen? Amen. And its connection is to this humility. Listen to the New Living Translation. It says, take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart. Say gentle at heart. I, I, I heard it said like this. One, one person, I, I, man, I heard this. I'm like, whew. This is, this is when you really know, I feel like, kind of where you're at. And I've, I've had, you know, I've had 
op, I have had opportunity to, to, to grow in this a lot, you know, different times, but some people say, well, you know, when, when they get under pressure or when they are in pain or something like that, they just can't help it. But you can. See, that, again, is sort of writing yourself a hall pass for acting however you want to act. I remember my mom, she's gone home to be with the Lord now. She went a few years ago. And my mom was dealing with some things physically. And I was just having a conversation about this today at lunch with my, one of my business partners. And we were talking about humility and walking in humility. <laughs> and uh, I said, you know, it was, uh, I'll never forget the day. My mom was actually down at Moffitt uh, Cancer Center. And she was in a tremendous amount of pain. <laughs> And uh, I was in the room with her. We were talking and things like that. And, and, you know, it was just very obvious, very apparent. And she was just, you know, doing what she, you know, the best she could and, and just fighting the good fight of faith, man, all the way. Praise God. And I remember because here she was in a tremendous amount of pain. And they were supposed to bring something up to her, and they didn't. And then she called, and they didn't. And she called again, and they didn't. And they were wonderful there. And they finally made it up there, and this lady that made it up to her, you know, um, uh, was, you know, just kind of just like a delivery person. And, uh, you know, this lady kind of walked kind of slow, and she had really thick glasses and, and a little bit, you know, you know, a little bit older. And she's like, I, I, I'm, so, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to, you know, be late, and I didn't mean to, you know, come in here. I see you have family, or, or you have family here, and I don't want to interrupt. And my mom reached out and grabbed her, and, and grabbed her by, by the shirt. She said, looked her straight in the eye. She goes, it's okay. You're family too. And the lady just, like, melted. It was like, you don't need to make an apology. You're, you're serving me. You don't need to make an, an apology. And, you know, when people are in pain, they don't always act quite like that. And I'm sitting there going, if my mom can act like that, then I can act like that. And when I get hangry, I don't have to act like an idiot. <laughs> it was a lesson. It was a lesson. We can walk in humility. We can stay in this. Amen? He says, take my yoke upon me. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart. Say, gentle at heart. He says, and you will find rest for your souls. Let me read the message. It says, are you tired, worn out, burn out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me, and you'll recover your life. Glory to God. He says, I'll show you how to take a, re a real rest. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me. And look at this. I love this part. Work with me. We need to be willing to walk with the Lord and work with him. Say work with the Lord. A lot of, a lot of people don't think about it like that. Can you imagine? This, this is working with the Lord, meaning... He's the head. <laughs> he has the answers. And he is willing. I mean, now this is, what, this is what blows me away. The creator of all creation. The creator of the entire universe. Now think about that. Okay? The one who put all the stars in the sky, created all the galaxies, the Milky Way, the black holes, everything that's out there, he created it. And he is inviting us to work with him. If you've ever worked with someone who's smarter than you, it is a really cool experience. Because you go, oh man, they make that look so easy because they know so much, right? And he's saying, come with me, walk with me, work with me. Work with me. Now, you'd think, work with me? Okay, well... 
if I'm going to work with him, oh boy, man, that's, that's going to be a lot of work. No, he's, he's talking about how to, how to live in real rest. We work with him, and he shows us how to rest. That's so counterintuitive to what we think. We walk with him, work with him, and he's revealing to us how to live in a restful, peaceful state of mind and being seven days a week, 24 hours a day. That is, that is so cool. So he says, walk with me, work with me, watch how I do it. Glory to God. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. He says, I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll, you can this again, learn to live. Boy, there's a lot of learning we're reading tonight, amen? You will learn to live freely and lightly. It's true that there is a rhythm to God's grace. I meditated on that today. A rhythm to God's grace. Have you ever seen someone who just understands rhythm? Really? I mean, think about that. Who understands rhythm, and it just seems, it's like second nature to them. I mean, they can just, you know, my wife has really good rhythm. She just I have good rhythm, but she has better rhythm than I do. And our daughter, she's just so natural with rhythm, like a song, come on, and she can just do rhythm. And I just live, I'm like, that is so cool. It's just as natural for her. Just, it's just smooth. It's just, she does rhythm, just it, things that I could hold rhythm, but she adds to this rhythm in a way that just doesn't come as natural to me. Now, if I listen to her, I could copy her rhythm. But she, it just comes to her. And it's like with God, when we walk with him and we learn of him, he teaches us and shows us how to walk in this rhythm of God's grace to the point that it just becomes, we're just so gracious in so many areas of our life. In fact, our endeavor should be in every area of our life. Amen? Amen. Now, let me ask you this. On the contrary, have you ever seen someone who's out of rhythm, who doesn't have good rhythm, and they sort of try to force it? Or even this, have you ever seen somebody who, who's not really good at rhythm, but they want people to think they're good at rhythm, and they try to sell you that they're good at rhythm? <laughs> you, know, you know what I'm saying? They're like, oh, watch this. And you're like, yeah, you're just, you're not that smooth, you know? I mean, it, it was really apparent. We, we, we've had some wonderful drummers that have come through here, but there was this guy, Hiram, that, that was a drummer here. That guy is just the smoothest drummer I've maybe ever seen. And, you know, I mean, my brother was a drummer. I'm a musician, you know. But, and, and there's a lot of drummers who are good, but they're just good, and they think the louder they are, the gooder they are. Okay? But that's not necessarily true. This guy, he was so smooth, and he would just change. His dynamic way of rhythm was so smooth. It, it didn't matter what song it was. He, he, he knew, and he was trained. I found out later, he was trained in all different types of music growing up by one of the best musicians that, 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 that came out of the country that he's from. Um, uh, was Venezuela, right? From Venezuela. And he, he studied with one of the top guys in the country as a child and as a young adult. And he, his rhythm was just, it's just really second to none that I've ever heard and ever seen and been, been a part of. But he was very in tune with what whoever was leading, he was very sensitive to how they were leading and, and the flow of it. And he was also mostly sensitive to the Spirit of the Lord. Now, what's interesting, if you meet this guy, okay, apart from the drums, one of the most humble guys you'll ever meet. It's no coincidence that this guy, apart from the drum set, is so humble and walks and displays such humility. When he gets behind the drums, it just carries out through him the same humility which really, in part, is what makes him so good. 
because he's not trying to be the loudest person in the room behind the drum set. God is saying, walk with me. Learn of me. Let me teach you this, this rhythm of grace. And when you walk in grace, you get more grace. The Bible talks about that. You walk in a level of grace, you get more grace. You learn to operate in more grace. And it's like, it just keeps going. There's more grace. And then you operate in that. And then there's more grace. And if you've ever met somebody that operates in a higher level of grace than you, it's so refreshing, man. It's so beautiful. And that's what this message is doing. It's helping us all grow in this grace and to operate in more grace and in more grace. And I tell you what, we'll be the most attractive church in the country as we learn to walk and live in this grace. He says we can learn to live freely and lightly. It's, I mean, it's sad that more Christians aren't inspired to live like this, uh, to be more humble, and, but I'm here to encourage you and encourage all of us that we'll learn to walk in a greater measure of humility than we ever have in our life. I hope that you leave here going, you know what? I want to operate in more humility. I want to operate in more uh, meekness. And I want to uh, demonstrate the love of God in a greater measure than I ever have in my life before. Amen? Amen. Humility is not weakness. Amen? In fact, humility requires you to be very strong, and, but, but strong in the Lord. Amen? Strong in Him. Knowing who you are in Christ Jesus is the greatest revelation that you can have to know how to walk in humility and grace towards others. Listen to the Amplified Bible in Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29. He says, Take my yoke upon you, learn of me, for I am gentle, meek, and humble, lowly in heart. You will find rest, relief, ease, and refreshment, and recreation, and blessed quiet for your souls. Praise God. One more, Passion Translation. Simply join your life to mine. Learn my ways, and you'll discover that I am gentle, humble, easy to please. God is easy to please. I'm going to say it again. God is easy to please. That's what he's saying. God is easy to please. He says, you will find refreshment and rest for you from him, right? In him. God, a lot of people, a lot of Christians don't think and don't believe that God's easy to please. If you probably did a survey and said, do you think God's easy to please? Oh, no. Oh, no. Man, you got to do this. Man, you got to do that. Hey, oh, hey. No, he's not. He's not hard to please. He's easy to please. I'm going to say it again. God is easy to please. Oh, so right now, I think some people are going, what? No, no, he's not. That's not what I've been told. Well, read your Bible. Walk with him. Learn of him. You find if people think he's a hard taskmaster, oh, it's so hard to live for God. No, he's easy to please. Amen? Proverbs 3, 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, uh, acknowledge him, and he'll direct your paths, right? Go to 1 John 2, 16. I'm going to read this out of the Amplified Classic. It says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, craving and sensual gratification, and the lust of the eyes, greedy longings of the mind, look at this, and the pride of life. Say the pride of life. Now this says, assurance in one's own resources or in the stability of earthly things. It says, these do not come from the Father, but are from the world itself. Now, we're going to talk about this just for a few minutes here. We must be very aware not to trust in the stability of earthly things. This needs to be taught in our churches. We all need to be reminded of this. If you've been raised in the church, you probably have a knowing of this, but you may have drifted away from this. 
And the reason I say that is because the devil has a kingdom. He just does, the kingdoms of this world. And his kingdoms will fail. In fact, they're failing right now because his kingdoms are based on failing principles. And when people put their trust in earthly things, they are setting themselves up for failure. Amen? This is the New Living, in the same uh, verses. He says, For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure or a craving for everything we see and pride in our achievements and possessions. Boy, isn't that true? A pride in our achievements or our possessions. These are not from the Father, but are from the world. Whew, man. Now, we could go into a whole thing based on Matthew chapter 6. We might get to it later in this teaching, but I want to I move on here. Go to, Ma- go to Romans 5.17. Romans 5.17. Praise the Lord. It says, For if one man's offense, death reigned by one, who's Adam, right? Much more they which receive abundance of grace. Okay? Now, receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Right? Now, glory to God, what a powerful verse. Shall reign in life. How many want to reign in life? Amen. Amen? Well, we are set up for success. Jesus set us up for success. He says, reign in life. How do we reign in life? Well, we receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness, right? Now, you don't have to try very hard to find something to complain about. I made a comment three weeks ago that complaining is not reigning. Now, I made that comment, but I've done plenty of complaining since I made that comment. And I'm not happy about it, (laughs) but I want to change my complaining. And, And, man, I did a teaching years ago, and it was called Practicing the Vocabulary of Silence. And I've been reminding myself to not complain. And so I've just been practicing the vocabulary of silence. And sometimes you just have to, "Eh, ah, uh," and you want to complain. I don't know about you, but I like to complain, it seems like. And I'm trying to break myself out of the habit of complaining. And it's not been the easiest thing for me. And I'm working on it, all right? I'm working on it. So in the process, I've had to practice the vocabulary of silence. My wife says, are you okay? Something wrong? (laughs) It's not with her. It's with other stuff at work and things going on. And I'm just like, (sighs) I'm practicing the vocabulary of silence. You know what? Complaining is a trap. It's a trap. It's a snare. It's a trick. It's what the Bible calls the wiles of the devil, which is a clever trick to try, that he tries to set that we step into and ensnares us. You know what I'm talking about, right? Anybody else find it every once in a while, occasionally, like you want to complain just a little bit, maybe just a little bit? It's a trap. It's a trap. It's a trap. I mean, people around me at work, I, I can so find easy stuff to complain about. Turn the TV on, I can find plenty to complain about. This is, so, this is how silly I'm going to tell myself. I'll watch sporting events, professional athletes, 
and I'll complain about how they're doing what they're doing as if I should, have, should be the one who could sit there and tell them how to run the play and the route and what you're doing. Hey, you're a professional athlete, for goodness sake. Can you catch the ball? Hit your hands. Let's go. You know what all that is? Pride. It's all pride. It's all pride. It's what it is. And it's complaining. And it's a trap. You say, well, what's the big deal? Because what I've found in my life, you complain about one thing, it's really easy to complain about something else. And then I complain about something else. And then I complain about something else. And next thing you know, it's like I'm stuck in this trap that won't let go of me because I've developed a habit of complaining and it doesn't seem to leave. And I'm telling you, that is not how we enter into his rest. That is not soul prosperity and rest for your souls. That produces anxiety, worry, cares, and you, and you play right into the hand of the devil, honestly, and you begin to behave like the kingdom of darkness all the while you've been translated out of that kingdom into the kingdom of his dear son, which is the kingdom of light. It's a trick, and it's a trap. And we have to, we have to be willing to recognize it but know this, you can live free from it. You don't have to keep living like that. Well, you don't know, Pastor, what all is going on with me and my, and my house and this and this person and that person. You can live free from it. And you should, you should tell yourself, I can live free from that. I don't have to complain all the time. I don't have to complain 50% of the time. I don't have to complain at all. But you have to be willing to listen to the Spirit of the Lord in here you have to be willing to, to learn to know. So you've got to learn this. You can know it. You know it. You recognize other people that complain, but you have to learn to know. So like the instructor who does it so easily, and you go, oh, man, they make it look so easy. If you're ever around somebody that doesn't complain, you've ever been around somebody that just, you, it's like you never really hear them complain. You, no? Yeah, I can, th I can think of some people in this room. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just point you out, Tammy Larkins. I don't know, raise your hand. I'm going to embarrass you right now because <laughs> this is how humble you are. I don't know if I've ever heard her complain. And she used to be the office manager for our church and worked with her for years. I don't ever remember hearing her complain. If she did, it would have been so rare, I don't even remember it. It's just not who she is. She could. She could start tomorrow. And she could be the biggest complainer in the church if she let herself do it. It's not like, well, you know, she's special. And, you know, well, she didn't go through what I went through. Oh, she's been through plenty. She's been through plenty. And she could find a lot of reason to complain. I don't know that I've ever heard her complain. It's possible, <laughs> but I'm telling you, it's possible, right? Let me, thank you for letting me, I didn't ask permission, but embarrass you. I just wanted to let people know that there is somebody that actually exists that's like that. <laughs> Go to Proverbs chapter 15, verse 15 real quick. It's so important to be glad, isn't it? It's so important to be grateful. and so important to be thankful. It's so important to have a merry heart, isn't it? You know, this should, be, this should characterize us as Christians. Being grateful, thankful, having a merry heart. Look at Proverbs 15, 15. All the days of the afflicted are evil, but he that is of a merry heart, hath a continual feast. Whew. Isn't that beautiful? A continual feast. <laughs> it's interesting, the Amplified Bible says, it talks about those who are desponding and, and afflicted are evil by anxious thoughts and forebodings. But he who has a glad heart 
has a continual feast regardless of circumstances. Uh Uh-oh. What? Regardless of circumstances. Say regardless Regardless. of circumstances. circumstances. All right. Go to Psalm 1611. Thou will show me the path of life, and in thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. In thy presence is fullness of joy. In the presence of God, there is no sadness. There is no despair. There's no loss. There's no anxious thoughts. In the presence of God, there is fullness of joy. Mm. Go to James chapter 4, verse 6. It says, but I'm going to read the Amplified Classic Edition. It says, but he gives us more and more grace power of the Holy Spirit to meet this evil tendency and all others fully. That is why he says God sets himself against the proud and haughty, but gives grace continually to the lowly, those who are humble enough to receive it. More grace to the humble. Say that with me. More grace to the humble. This means if we choose to operate in pride, listen to this, then we limit, we we set a limit on the grace that we operate in our life. I'm going to say that again. If we operate in pride, if we choose to operate in pride, which is, it's a choice. It's a choice then we set a limit. We set the limit on the grace we operate in our life. We're saying, nope, I'm choosing pride and I'm not going to operate in that grace. I, I, I have a right to act like this. I have a right to live like this. What are we doing? We are setting the limit to the measure of grace that we operate in our life. It's there for us to operate in, but pride is what keeps us from operating in more grace. A lot of people don't think like that. They don't realize that. And listen, grace, you need to know this. Grace includes a lot of things. Grace includes the favor of God, his forgiveness. Uh, It includes the anointing. You, you, You choose to operate in pride, you limit the anointing of God on your life. Wow. You ever seen anybody like that maybe was in ministry, and you saw the anointing on their life, you're like, wow, so powerful, dynamic, it's just obvious, the anointing on their life. And then you see, maybe over time, pride sneaks in. Pride comes in. They allow pride and pride in, and you don't see them operating in that anointing anymore. It's sad. It's, 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 it's a sad thing, but it happens. And all the while, they're the ones that made the choice where pride was concerned, And they're the ones that limited that anointing and that grace and that favor of God and the power of the Spirit of God from operating in their life. Oh, all the while, it's limitless what they can operate in. But they choose to operate in pride. And Hey, and I'll say this, we're all guilty in some measure of this. Every one of us in the room is guilty in some measure of this. You know, you can't expect godly results in your life by getting there by the devilish means of pride. And I tell you what, this is why a lot of people get so frustrated. They become frustrated in life. And they never take a self-inventory of their own thoughts, their own actions, their own words, 
It's always blame, 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 everything out here circumstantial, rather than taking responsibility for their own thoughts, their own words, their own actions, and going, you know what? Maybe, just maybe, it's me. <laughs> maybe I'm not operating in the humility, the love of God, and meekness, and maybe I'm the reason why I'm limiting the success in my own life. That's, sometimes that's a hard pill to swallow, but you at least need to be aware of that may be the reason why you're not operating in a higher level of success and operating in the grace that God's made available for you to operate in. Amen? Did you get something out of this? Stand to your feet, please. Praise God. <laughs> Got, got pretty quiet in here. It's all right. It's all right. It's all right. You just didn't want to talk with your mouth full. I understand. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. Lord, we just thank you, Father, for your word. Lord, thank you for your teachings. Thank you for, for the revelation. Thank you for the Holy Spirit who is a constant in our life, a constant help, wisdom, depths of, of understanding and knowledge of how to live successfully and how to live with rest as part of our daily life. I mean, just at rest. At rest at work, at rest at school, at rest at home, continually soul rest. You revealed tonight, you, you pulled back the curtain for us to see how to walk and live in that rest. I pray that every one of us walk through it. We just walk right into that and say, you know what? I desire that for my life. I want to walk and live with you. I want to learn of you, Lord. Reveal to me how to do it in a greater measure, at a greater level. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Praise God. We're so glad you came out tonight. Hey, if you're here and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, meaning you don't know if you're saved, okay? You can know before you leave this place. We always want to give people that opportunity to receive Jesus Christ into their life, make him Lord of their life, and live as a Christian, all right? So if you're here and you've never done that, as I dismiss, I want to give you the opportunity to come out of your seat, walk down here. These people are up here to pray with you. Or if you'd like prayer in any other area of your life, we're here to join our faith with your faith and believe God for a miracle. Remember this, you're the head and not the tail, above and not beneath. Bless going in, bless going out. Everything you set your hand to, you're the lender, not the borrower. You're good looking, you're dismissed. God bless you.